Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends in Jesus and Mary, the seven sorrows of Our Lady have a special relevance to the time of Lent, of course, not exclusive to Lent. We know that the major feast for the seven sorrows is September 15th, but few uh, are aware of the fact that there used to be a special feast day on the Friday before Holy Week, which was called the Compassion of Mary. And the church, in its liturgical wisdom, thought it was very fruitful to ponder the sorrows of Our Lady in union with the sufferings of Jesus for our redemption. And so, why did Our Lady, for example, reveal to the founding members of the Servites of Mary back uh, in the 13th century, uh, the importance of the seven sorrows, and why did that become a mission of this mendicant order, a, a Marian mendicant order that uh, reached 10,000 people by the end of the 13th century with a special call, the charism, to preach and spread, to meditate upon, and to ponder the seven sorrows. Why did St. Bridget of Sweden also receive from Our Lady in the 14th century uh, very powerful promises for those who would recite consistently the seven sorrows? Why did Our Lady at Cabejo in our own age in Rwanda uh, speak about the importance of returning to the contemporary church's mind and heart uh, a, a pondering of the seven sorrows for us today? Well, two essential reasons. Number one, if you ponder the seven sorrows, you truly appreciate, uh, like never before, the role of Our Lady as the co-redemptrix, the suffering that our mother did, totally in union with Jesus, completely dependent on Jesus, but still uniquely Marian for each one of us. Every gift of grace should be applauded, should be revered. And Our Lady's gift of grace her role in the redemption was something that, as St. Louis Maria de Montfort tells us, was absolutely ordained by God as the best way by which we come to Jesus, is pondering, uh, living, consecrating ourselves to Our Lady and to her unique role in the redemption. The second reason why it's so fruitful and, and why, in a special way, it's uh, relevant to the season of Lent is because as we ponder how Our Lady suffers, it helps us to suffer better. It helps us to suffer well. I would dare say, my friends, that if you take the seven sorrows together, it will uh, incorporate, it will, it will encompass, it will include all elements of human suffering. Uh, that includes all the elements that we are called to suffer. But here, as we ponder how our mother endured her seven sorrows, it teaches us how to suffer more patiently, with greater perseverance, with more charity, and ultimately offering every single element of our suffering with Jesus and Mary for the salvation of souls. That's a sublime value, and that's why Our Lady calls us in a special way to remember her sorrows to help us with our sorrows. So let's briefly go through the seven sorrows. And I do encourage you, uh, and I know, you know, during Lenten times, we're always wrestling with what is best to do, what sacrifices, what new prayers. But I would be remiss if I didn't strongly encourage you to, in some way, in some way, incorporate the seven sorrows into your Lenten experience. Uh, Our Lady, uh, in her approved apparitions in Cabejo, Rwanda, uh, specified Tuesdays and Fridays as special days of uh, relevance to ponder her sorrows. Isn't that interesting? Those are the days, if you pray five decades to the rosary uh, each day, those are the sorrowful mystery days. So it is to ponder what Our Lady did alongside and in total union in service to what our Lord does, uh, the two hearts that saved us. And that will help us uh, help our hearts to be formed according to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So let's give a, a, a quick pondering to these seven sorrows. And again, in, in most formats, it's simply uh, reciting the sorrow 
one comparing our father, but uh, the heart of it is seven Hail Marys while we're pondering Our Lady's seven sorrows. So the first sorrow is the presentation. And we recall that with the presentation, Simeon comes up to Mary and Joseph about the child Jesus and says essentially, A, to Mary now, your son will be the light of the world, but he'll also be a sign of contradiction. And therefore, too, your heart too will be pierced. And so from that moment onward, and most commentators, even mystical authors say that even from the Annunciation, Mary knows clearly that her child will be not only the Messiah, but he will be the fulfillment of the suffering servant of Isaiah. And that means his suffering will be so intense, he will be hardly recognizable. And so clearly what Our Lady starts with at the Annunciation is confirmed in the words of Simeon. That means, as other uh, spiritual writers will, will say, Mary's joy from that point onward will always be a qualified joy. Why? Because she'll always have, whether in, in the forefront of her consciousness or or more reserved, that her son was born to die. And that's why even artworks, uh, many artworks of the Madonna and Child have the joyous baby Jesus, but the sorrowful mother. She knows her son is born to die. And she will experience that sorrow for the 33 years until they both reach Calvary. One of my children, Mary Bernadette, uh, was uh, born with, uh, uh, soon after I should say, uh, acquired a very serious infection that was a life-threatening infection. So she uh, spent six weeks in the neonatal ICU. Well, as I uh, took off work and and spent that time in the hospital uh, uh, at her side, uh, I was in the parental room of the neonatal ICU and a couple were seated across from me and the doctor came in and said, I have very difficult news to convey to you. Your child has a rare disease that will gradually break down every single one of her bodily systems. It will attack the nervous system, the respiratory system, the skeletal system, and over the period of the next two years, you will watch your daughter gradually die. And I'm sorry to say there's nothing we can do about it. And I've always carried with me uh, the intensity of those words and, and mindful of the two young parents that had to bear them. But we have to remember, this is what Our Lady endured for 33 years, knowing that her son would be horrifically crucified, that he would suffer the greatest physical and emotional, psychological and spiritual suffering of any being in creation, in history. And so Mary bore that, and she offered it for souls. O oh, Mother, co-redemptrix, help us to suffer well. The second sorrow is the event of the flight into Egypt. Imagine that Our Lady indeed would have Herod's special forces, for lack of a better term, seeking the death of her child. Um, Our Lady uh, with St. Joseph leave uh, with time only to grab that which was essential uh, to take off and flee to Egypt. Just the sense that she had a small army seeking to kill her child uh, would be such a, a, a sword to her heart. And she would have to, uh, throughout that period of time, wonder when would Herod's men stop? How far would they go to achieve their commissioned purpose? And so the Holy Family become refugees. And our world is not unfamiliar with refugees. You and I probably have not experienced being a refugee, uh, but refugees uh, are part of human tragedy today. You have over 3 million refugees that are being housed 
uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, by the generous uh, people of Poland. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I saw a young family. They had a little sign uh, that said, we are refugees, and uh, they were seeking some funding. So at any rate, I had uh, a meal with that family, and they conveyed uh, in the very little English that only the husband knew, the wife knew no, no English at all, that they had flee uh, Moldova because of the aggression of Russia to this neighboring country, and they sold the little they had, and they flew to the United States. They were living out of uh, a van, uh, a very small uh, van, and they were sleeping uh, with the four children and mom and dad in that van. And they said, we can only trust in God. We have no idea of our future. They were waiting close to a city where at least the children would be possible uh, uh, candidates for getting passports, but the parents uh, would not have that possibility. Uh, refugees are real to our situation. Refugees come especially through things like a desire for property or power or sadly even a desire for death as the Holy Family had to experience. This detaches us from things of the world, from the material world, uh, in ways that are hard to, to compare with, with any other means since it is life contingent that one leave to save their bodies from the approaches of, uh, of aggressors. This was the life of the Holy Family. O oh, Mother Corrie Demtrix, help us, according to our own circumstances, to suffer well. The third sorrow of Our Lady is the loss of the child Jesus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary were united as soon as Our Lady says yes, at least in the sense that it's blood from her immaculate heart that's pumped to her womb that would begin to form the fleshy human heart of Jesus Christ. Those two hearts would not be separated until the event in the temple, where for three days Our Lady would be separated from her son's most sacred heart in a physical, geographical way. Parents are quick to testify the anguish that happens if they lose one of their children at a public event, even for 10 minutes, especially a small child. Uh, at first, one just frantically searches, and then one starts thinking of what, what could have happened, and if it extends to 20 minutes or a half an hour, one is pondering the possibility of kidnapping and, and other terrible uh, uh, possibilities. But what about for three days? And so we see that God the Father does not protect Our Lady from the deepest human sufferings as part of her role as the Corridentrix, the new Eve, with Jesus, the divine Redeemer, the new Adam. And so we ask Our Lady to help us to experience these separation uh, experiences we have with children. Sometimes the child is not so small, not so young. There's a separation sometimes through difficulties that happen, through strained relationships. But all parents suffer when they're separated from their children. And we have to use that suffering, as Our Lady did, to save souls, to offer it for the glory of God, the salvation of souls, for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Will Mother Corridemtrix help us to suffer well? The fourth sorrow through the seventh sorrow, bring us in proximity to Calvary. And the fourth sorrow is where Mary accompanies her son carrying the cross. In the Passion of the Christ, it is dramatically posed that Jesus looks to Mary. This is extra biblical. It really comes from the revelations of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. But there's a glance between Jesus and Mary as Jesus falls under the weight of the cross. And Jesus says, See, Mother, I make all things new. And so Our Lady, as the co-redemptrix, is called to join her divine Son, the divine, the only divine Redeemer, in this great work. Who may you be called to support during a great cross, to help uh, 
survive, to help endure, to help persevere during an event of, of great suffering. Uh, if you do so, you know, of course, that you will be suffering too. That's why compassion from the Latin root means compassio, with suffering, that is to suffer with someone. It's not just a, a, a remote empathy, it's to suffer with them. And so we ask Our Lady to help us to suffer with whom we are called to help carry their cross. And even if that in, uh, includes uh, intense suffering on our part, that we may do it f with faith, helping a beloved uh, carry their cross, even if that means intense suffering for us as well. O Mother Co-Redemptrix, may we suffer well. The fifth sorrow is the sorrow of sorrows. It is the presence of Mary at Calvary. She watches her son die. It's a three-hour process which bespeaks the greatest suffering of any being in all history. And as the suffering comes to an end, in that end of a third hour, two things happen. Number one, Jesus says to Mary and to John, Woman, behold your son. And then to John, behold your mother. And as Pope St. John Paul II tells us, John represents two sets of people. One, all disciples, all who seek to be other Johns in following Jesus. But also, two, all humanity. Why? Because Jesus dies for all humanity. He doesn't just do a net redemption, so to speak. He doesn't just say, well, I know the people that are going to go to hell. I can see all things past, present, and future. And I'm only going to suffer for those who are going to take advantage of the graces of my redemption. That's not the generosity of our Savior. He suffers for all, even for those who do not choose to accept the graces of their own salvation. Mary shares in that suffering. St. John Paul II says that she's spiritually crucified with her crucified son, but her role, I'm quoting now, her role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the glorification of her son. Yes, indeed, Our Lady's suffering on our behalf doesn't end at Calvary, but it is, in a certain sense, climactic. It is a summit, it is an apex of the suffering that any human person will experience. Remember, Jesus is not a human person. Jesus is a divine person with human nature. No human person will suffer as Mary suffered, the new Eve with the new Adam, joining in one single joint sacrifice, one single offering to the Father for the redemption of souls. And so, as we experience the greatest sufferings. And that's why Mary at Calvary embodies all forms of suffering, every single aspect of human suffering, because no one suffered like Our Lady suffered at Calvary. So it encompasses every form, every species, every manifestation, every experience of human suffering. And so we have our model to suffer well. How? How does she do it? What did she do? She united her sufferings to Jesus, and she offered them to the Father. That's what our call is, regardless of what the suffering is. Remember what Our Lady tells the children at Fatima. Make, us, make of everything you can a suffering, and offer it to the Most High for the salvation of souls. O Mother Co-Redemptrix, may we suffer well. The sixth sorrow is commonly called the Pieta. This is when the dead body of Jesus is taken from the cross and laid into the arms of his mother. Here, my friends, Jesus has given up all for you and me, and Mary gets a concrete examination of the price of the forgiveness of my sins, my personal sins, and, and your personal sins. Every scourging, every hole in his scalp that comes from that crown, every uh, section of, of, of body 
of flesh that is removed from the flagrum, the, the, the Roman instrument of torture, which typically had three uh, straps of leather with, with a, a, a ball uh, of iron or a lead or a stone at the end, so every striking would count as three, and those would literally remove sections of flesh. The mother sees it all. She sees it firsthand. She washes Jesus. She washes the body of the redemption, which, remember, she gave him. She gave him that body, the instrument of redemption. And that's Hebrews 10.10. 10. We are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. That body came from Mary. And so we see now a grief at an ultimate loss. Uh, now Jesus has died. I recall a mother, a very dedicated mother, who lost her child uh, when her child was very young. And as people tried to console her, she would later admit that the consolation didn't help. It, it was, in some cases, even harder because the, 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 the depth of her suffering was so intense that well-intentioned efforts, uh, efforts to console her were not being satisfactory. She said, I could only stare at the Pieta because I knew that woman knows what I'm enduring. That woman knows what I'm going through. And so pondering this sick sorrow helped this mother experience the grief that comes from death. And we will all experience that grief that comes from death in different forms. Loved ones, friends, even those we respect. Uh, Our Lady has done it before. She can help us uh, experience our grief and work through our grief and offer our grief so that others may benefit, that it will in no sense be wasted regardless of the tragic circumstances of that grief. O Mother Co-Redemptrix, may we suffer well. The seventh and final sorrow. The body of Jesus is laid in the tomb. This is the sorrow of apparent failure. This is the sorrow where it looks from a human perspective like all has been for naught. All was at a loss. All well intended resulted in nothing. In fact, it resulted in uh, far worse than nothing. It it resulted in tragedy. That would be a human perspective. It was not the mother's perspective. It was not the co-redemptrix perspective. Why? Because Mary would, in, in a certain sense, bring the church, bring the apostolic community through the paschal mystery of the passion, the death, leading to the resurrection. Do you know why we honor our Blessed Mother every Saturday? Have you, ever, have you ever pondered why? Uh, why even at Fatima she requests reparation on first Saturdays? Because Saturday is her day of bringing in testimony to believing in Jesus, to a faith in the Redeemer, what the Redeemer said, that he would rise on the third day. She was almost on her own. She was almost by herself. We don't know to what extent others joined, but certainly the mystical writings say that it was Mary that had to, in the midst of having just experienced this untold suffering, like no other creature. I mean, John Paul II says in Salvifici Dolores on, on the document of human sufferings that Mary experienced an intensity of suffering almost unimaginable by the human person. Almost unimaginable. We can imagine some pretty horrendous things, but such was the depth of Our Lady's suffering. And yet, in the midst of this suffering, she had to tend to those around her whose faith were severely rocked, whose faith was was really threatened. And so, it is Mary, in her example, that lets us know that we're not called to look at things from a human perspective. We're always called to look at something from a supernatural perspective. And so the burial was the first step towards the resurrection. How do we know? Because of faith. 
It's faith that can make us see that even in the midst of some of the greatest sufferings we'll ever endure, when that suffering's united with the cross of Jesus, with Our Lady, it will be supernaturally fruitful. Again, St. John Paul II says, Mary's suffering was an offering that was fruitful for the entire world, a contribution to the redemption of all, to use the Holy Father's words. We can do our part in offering what appears to be human failure. Think back of things that even now, a suffering, uh, a, a, a loved one going uh, in a wrong direction, uh, uh, violations of fidelity, uh, again, uh, challenges of, of, of drug abuse, or abortions, uh, you, you, we know the list of potential sufferings, of potential perceptions of failure. All of those can still be used to save souls. That's what we get from Our Lady. That's what we get from pondering the seven sorrows in general. Suffering is redemptive. That's the Catholic motto. That's the Catholic mantra. That's the Catholic bumper sticker. Suffering, when united with Jesus and Our Lady, is always redemptive. And that's why during this Lent, we can be hopefully more generous with our prayers, with our fastings, with our almsgiving, with the patient endurance of the crosses that always typically come during Lent. You know, if you examine Lent carefully, I think uh, you'll see that in a certain sense, God withholds some of the grace so that we can be more greatly purified. And challenges of every sort seem to hit us during Lent. Why? Because our Lord is trying to make it difficult? No, because he's trying to perfect us as gold and silver are perfected. That's through fire. That's through being tested. So I encourage you during this Lent, incorporate in some way, prayerfully consider including in some concrete and consistent way, pondering the seven sorrows. You'll never regret the time you spend joining Our Lady, joining her sufferings, which again will lead to a a, a newfound appreciation for what our Immaculate did, Mother did for each one of us, and B, we, we as members of the faith, will suffer better. We can suffer well, and Our Lady will help us do that uh, like no one else as the Mediatrix of all graces, uniting us to the cross of Jesus Christ. It's Dr. Mark Miravalli saying, God bless you all.